and thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Here's what we're looking at. Was it a sound decision for Chicago to drop the shot spotter gunshot technology? Hear from two older people with very different opinions. Here in the land of Lincoln, we think big and we intend to win big. So as we kick off a preview of the governor's budget address and what it means for Chicago. This black woman wasn't getting any kind of justice in the criminal arena. And he's become a household name for civil rights. We sit down with attorney Benjamin Crump. And now to some of today's top stories. School resource officers, or SROs, could be removed from all Chicago public high schools beginning this fall. That's according to a new resolution from the city's Board of Education to be introduced this week. The resolution directs CPS CEO Pedro Martinez to develop and implement a new school safety policy that includes ending the use of SROs by next school year. The board says the new policy must be presented for final approval by its June 27th meeting. Nurses at UChicago Medicine are voting on whether to authorize a strike. If passed, it would mean the bargaining team could call for a work stoppage. Workers say their concerns include staffing and retention issues. National Nurses United says they represent 2,800 nurses at UChicago Medicine. Chicago voters will be once again able to cast their ballot ahead of the March 19th primary. Early voting had kicked off last Thursday, but was paused a day later after an appellate court ruled judicial candidate Ashante Rice must be removed from the ballot. The Chicago Board of Elections offices and its Loop Super site will reopen for early voting tomorrow at 9 a.m. You can check out our WTTW News Voter Guide to learn more about how to vote and about the candidates on this year's ballot. That's all at WTTW.com slash Voter Guide. Up next, a debate over controversial policing technology and public discipline for cops right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the Alexandra and John Nichols family, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. The controversial gunshot detection technology ShotSpotter is on its way out. Mayor Brandon Johnson announced the city's contract with ShotSpotter is set to end in September after a last minute decision on whether to renew the deal and confusion about when the agreement would actually end. ShotSpotter has the backing of the city's top cop, but it's been criticized for being ineffective and contributing to over policing. In another police related move, the city council for a second time rejected a proposal for certain police disciplinary hearings to be private. Joining us to dive deeper into these issues are Alderman Andre Vasquez of the 40th Ward on the north side and Alderman Anthony Napolitano of the 44, 41st Ward on the northwest side. We've got the 40th and the 41st here. Thank you both for joining us. Yeah, so starting with ShotSpotter, as we mentioned, the city signed a seven month extension of the contract followed by a two month transition period. Alderman Napolitano, over to you first. What's your reaction to that? I'm glad there's an extension. Um, I think this is a tool that we need as we're losing police officers. Statistics show that uh, this, this tool works. Uh, we have less officers on the street. Technology should be a part of this now. Um, the ShotSpotter has proven that we have uh, in 2023 over 43,000 uh, reports of shots fired and the amount of those shots fired comes to about 187,000 different rounds that have been have been let off uh, uh, and detected by the system. Um, not only does it does it help you uh, triangulate where crime is happening, but only 87% of people are calling the police behind these shots being fired. So these are saving lives too. If you're triangulating where shots are coming from, you might have a, a victim that's down that wasn't called in by the police. So it's a program that shows it does work. And as like I said in the beginning, as we're losing officers, we need more technology to step in as well. Alderman Vasquez, your thoughts on this technology being phased out? Yeah, I think when we talk about the city thinks about as far as technology, we've never actually determined what we want it to do. So when you talk to ShotSpotter or Sound Thinking now, at first it was violence reduction. What we see is studies show it doesn't reduce any violence. When we talk about clearance rates, it doesn't actually increase clearance rates when it comes to actually um, apprehending people. So I think if the question is about response times, it makes sense to have that conversation, but because the city's never determined what it wants to do, what metrics, how do you judge success, to just keep putting money in without understanding what 
what you want to get out of any technology. It's just a bit irresponsible with taxpayer dollars. Um, Alderman Napolitano, a 2021 study from the MacArthur Justice Center said that only 10% of shot spotter alerts um, likely even involved an actual gun. Um, are you concerned that this uh, technology could be deploying officers to the wrong places? And is this technology worth the cost if, uh, if research has been showing that it's not actually picking up on actual gunshots? That's a great question, but um, God, no. Um, even if you get a detection and it's a, it's a false detection, you're at least putting officers in areas where they not, might not have patrolled earlier. Uh, the biggest problem even on the northwest side of Chicago is we have no officers. All of our officers are allocated to other districts. Uh, the largest district in the city of Chicago. If I had an officer that went over there into our neighborhood or in our ward area just for a false call, that's one more officer I have that's deterring crime. So it might not put you there on the spot if you see the crime that, or, or because it's an actual shot or a backfire, uh, you're putting more police officers in areas that need crime prevention. So it's it's a it's a tool that could help. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what my colleague's saying is highlighting why you don't want to invest in technology, right? If you have officers going where they shouldn't be because it's a false call, then they're not where they should be, where there's actual activity happening. So if you're not really playing it smart about where you want officers and resources to be, and you're playing whack-a-mole with a blindfold on, you're not solving the problems where you need officers to be at because they're busy going to false detection. Oh, if, if I could answer that though, sure. just right back really quick. It's a great. He brings up a great point, but there is no there's no crime book. There's no there's no cliff notes to crime. It's it's where you're at in the right time. Good good police works is just patrol and happen to be on scene. It's it, you can't detect where shots are going to be fired, but if you hear something in areas that have the shot spotter, you're now amping up your patrol. Okay, so I want to get to last week's vote on police disciplinary hearings. Uh, this was the second time in two months that older people overwhelmingly rejected an arbitrator's ruling, uh, allowing officers accused of serious wrongdoings to bypass the police board and instead have their cases heard in private. Um, Alderman Vasquez, you voted uh, against that, which is uh, against uh, the arbitration offering option. Why was that? Yeah, so when we think about the amount of money being spent on police misconduct, right? Over $100 million every single year. Uh, and we're talking about officers who are either gonna get suspended for a year or be removed from the force. My argument is those folks shouldn't be officers to begin with. So when we're having those kind of cases, I believe they need to be public. It's in the public interest for people to understand what calls have been made. Because when officers make the right call, there needs to be an understanding of that. And when they're not making the right call, it also needs to be public. Doing all the stuff behind closed doors doesn't lead to improvement of the model, it doesn't lead to accountability, and it leads to more losses of fund when we talk about police misconduct. Alderman Napolitano? Yeah, you know, see, this comes down to the collective bargaining agreement, and, and part of it is that police officers don't have the right to strike. So it's created that when they do negotiate a contract, that they come to an impasse, you go to arbitration, and that's the agreement. When it goes to arbitration, an arbitrator looks at it and agrees upon it and sends it back to us, and we're supposed to vote on it because that, they don't have the right to strike anymore. It's come back to us twice. The big conversation here is, is creating more transparency. If you look with the Chicago Police Department, I have a list. There's over 13 different types of transparency that overlook the Chicago Police Department, from our attorney general down to um, police supervisors, state's attorneys, body-worn cameras. Police officers are being fired at a, at a higher rate than ever before for things that they're doing wrong or misconduct-wise. But the problem is this is being done more as, as an anti-police movement. This I, is being, I, I firmly disagree with that. This it's is, not about being pro or anti-police. It is about pro people shouldn't be police in the first place. So when we're talking about the fact that if you have so many different oversight measures and you're still spending $100 million or more every single year on misconduct, it's not working. And so we have a police board for a reason to try to gut it into nothing doesn't to a better system. Well, oh. and we, we understand the debate's not over as well, right? right? Attorneys for the city and police union are now scheduled to bring this before a judge next week. Um, uh, and you've warned that this, Alderman Napolitano, you've warned that this could get expensive, like the legal battle just yeah. arguing over yeah. this could cost the city a lot. It is going to get expensive because the city's going to lose this case when it, when it goes to court with the Chicago Police Department. And, and you know, going back to what my colleague said, that we're, the city's losing money in, in, in cases that are brought against the police. The, we're, we're firing police officers. We have measures set up in place. We're, the reason why we're, we're gaining or losing so much money is because we don't try any of these cases. And the reason why we're doing that, which I think is an anti-police movement, is they're letting the police fail. So that you can go back budget time and say, this is where you're failing. This is what you're costing the city of Chicago. This is how you are inappropriate or you're not a strong department. So my colleague and I have had this debate before 
And I think if we want to really talk about the amount of money that's being saved by settlements, if you were actually to take these to court and keep a score about how much money you would actually be losing, you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. So, so I think it's a lot One more policing issue because we're just about out of time. Tomorrow, city council is supposed to vote on whether the police department should be forced to do an analysis of how it deploys its officers. Um, they'd have to allow an outside agency to do the analysis. We've got 20 seconds. Alderman Vasquez, how are you voting? Yeah, I'm voting for it. We know that uh, Superintendent Brown and before that have never told us where officers are, what the resources are, how they need to be allocated. We need data-driven solutions. Just guessing because people are afraid doesn't get us more safety. Alderman Napolitano. I'm voting no. This is another way to yellow line the police department and defund them and pull from their budget. You're getting rid of ShotSpotter, you're taking police officers out of our schools, you're looking to go against their arbitrations. All this is being done is to weaken the Chicago Police Department a little bit. I'll just say, right. cops have never been defunded. The budget's only gone But you're trying to. So it's there. But All right, Alderman Andre Vasquez, Alderman Anthony Napolitano, <laughs> thanks to you both Thank for you. joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Up next, the governor delivers his budget address tomorrow. Amanda Vinicky joins us from Springfield for a preview right after this. Governor J.B. Pritzker faces a projected budget shortfall ahead of his budget address. Meanwhile, White Sox owner Jerry Reinsdorf visits Springfield to push for a new stadium, and Mayor Brandon Johnson promises to spend all of the city's federal COVID relief dollars. Here with all that and more is our Spotlight Politics team, Heather Sharon, Paris Schutz, and live from Springfield, Amanda Vinicky. Welcome back, everyone. So, Amanda, let's start with you first, please. Tomorrow, as we said, the governor will give his uh, state budget address from Springfield. He's facing, though, a nearly $900 million dollar deficit. How does he plan to address that? We don't know exactly what he is going to do to address that. We know already that he's got a whole lot of spending pressures and asks. There are Democrats who want to expand and include a child tax credit. There is pressure to spend more on new arrivals. These asylum seekers, he's already promised $182 million to that effect. So it is a difficult task for him, that is for sure. But we know that the governor is really trying to pride his reputation on balancing the state's budget. And so he's going to present some sort of plan that he is at least going to say will be balanced. Uh, Illinois GOP members held a press conference today ahead of the governor's budget address where they uh, placed a lot of emphasis on the migrant crisis. Here's some of what they had to say. Instead of more free health care for non-citizens, we want to see efforts to lower costs for uh, Illinois citizens. Instead of non-citizen programs, we want to see efforts to make Illinois more affordable for working families, seniors, and our most vulnerable populations. Instead of more efforts to skirt federal immigration uh, officials, we want to see more funding for training and recruitment of police officers to make Illinois families safe. Amanda, Governor Pritzker uh, said that he would ask lawmakers for $182 million in the upcoming budget. Uh, how has he responded to the GOP? Well, it's not just the GOP. There has also been pushback from members of his own party who say that there are plenty of needy longtime residents in communities that deserve attention. That's where you haven't seen. It's not just that $182 million ask going forward. The state has already spent an extra $160 million that the governor has said that he's going to ask the General Assembly to essentially backfill. And the reason that you haven't had the Democratic-controlled legislature approve that yet is because of what I just said. So it's not just Republican pushback. This is where it's really the beginning of a negotiation process. We've got months and you're going to surely have Democrats that are going to be saying, hey, wait, in order for my vote to do that, I need something to bring back to my community. 
Heather, what does this indicate about uh, Chicago and Johnson's, Mayor J Brandon Johnson's relationship with Governor Pritzker? Well, it's tough. I would imagine Governor Pritzker would have an easier time getting people on board if the city had agreed to come up with the $70 million that it initially indicated it was at least open to. The problem is, is that the governor and the mayor's relationship was really poisoned by the whole debate over the winterized base camp, sort of the mayor moving forward, only to have the governor sort of pull back right away. Whether they can resolve that and get to a place where they come up with a total of $250 million from the state, the county, and the city to care for the new arrivals, even as everybody's bracing for a big influx once the weather warms up for real, I think is a significant question. Let's, let's add in, you've got the, the Chicago Teachers Union about to negotiate a new contract. The mayor saying, where are we going to get all this money? Well, we're going to go to the state because they can only raise their portion of the property tax levy a certain percentage. It does not look like, from everything that we're hearing right now, that the, there's going to be a big appetite from the governor and state lawmakers to bail out the CPS and give them all the things that they want here to afford a new C a teachers union contract and, and, the, and the things that they're going to ask for. So, uh, Paris, let's also talk about White Sox owner Jerry Reinsdorf. He was in Springfield today asking for nearly a billion dollars in public funds uh, to build a new stadium at the 78th. What's his reasoning for asking for all this money? Can well, I have you, some? Because he's Jerry Reinsdorf. you got to <laughs> hand it to Jerry Reinsdorf. It doesn't matter what the climate uh, we're living in is. He's going to go down with his cup out asking for taxpayer dollars. That's how he built Guaranteed Rate Field. That's how he got it renovated. Now, what he's saying is we want to extend an existing 2% hotel tax that sort of backed the bonds that renovated and built Guaranteed rate field it's going to expire it's like let's just extend it it's tourists it's visitors paying that we'll extend it to pay for this stadium and then according to cranes he wants a special taxing district uh, to fund some of it too so for a billion dollars in total so it's not like it's you know a billion dollars out of current tax coffers and his argument is that we're there's nothing on that land right now we're going to create a baseball stadium. We're going to create buildings, businesses. It's going to create tons of tax revenue. Give us a little boost here to help us do that. And he's got a compelling argument for that. It's the South Loop. There, it's waiting to explode, and there's nothing sitting on that very valuable piece of land. So, Heather, after you reported that the city had only used 29% to federal COVID uh, relief funds, reporters asked Mayor Johnson about it, and he says it's very important to him, and of course that he's going to spend some time uh, making sure that neighborhoods that have historically been disinvested have access to those dollars. But did he specify how or when he's going to spend that money? He didn't. And the deadline is looming. The city has until the end of the year to budget those dollars, and they have the until the end of 2026 to actually spend those. So this is going to be a pot of money where all of those competing needs are going to come in, and there are going to be a lot of people asking, hey, can't we use these federal dollars to sort of fill this very difficult need? It's going to be a big debate in the coming months, and I think it's going to be a, another big test of Johnson's leadership. Okay, so much to say about that. We'll save it for next week's Spotlight Politics. Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, Paris Schutz. Thanks, gang. Up next, a leading civil rights attorney with Chicago Ties. But first, a look at the weather. When names like Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, and of course, George Floyd became household names, it's partly because one attorney and his team made it possible. Attorney Benjamin Crump is Florida based, but spent some time in Chicago and has himself become a household name, often appearing alongside families who've experienced violence at the hands of police. We sat down with Crump and his partner, attorney Antonio Romanucci, last week and started by asking how their alliance was formed. Uh, probably 10, 11 years ago, because I had tried a case in the Middle District of Florida, which is a very difficult district when it comes to the jury pool down there. But we did get a, a verdict on a case, but I needed my fees to be approved by a judge. And, and Ben had just finished the Trayvon Martin case right around that time. And so I thought I was going to take a flyer. If I needed somebody to vouch and validate the work that I did, I couldn't think of a better person, even though I'd never met him. So I called him cold, and, and he was right there for it. And it Amazing looks like, man. Looks like the two of you have gotten to be friends over... No, no question. More yeah. like brothers, really. And, and I'll say this. Uh, I, I haven't even told Tony this. The reason why I think Tony is such a prince of a man is when it's not the George Floyd cases. He still is as passionate as ever working on those cases that get no attention. 
Mr. Crump, when we spoke a couple of years ago, uh, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson had just been confirmed for the Supreme Court. You were then calling for federal police reform, the uh, George Floyd Justice in Policing Act at the time. Uh, there's been little progress since then. Why do you think it's been so slow? Obviously, politics is a intriguing animal. Um, but we have made progress. I, I don't want our supporters to get discouraged. There have been over a hundred bills across America enacted in the name of George Floyd, talking about banning choke holes, talking about a duty to intervene. You know, these things that Tony and I are so passionate about with George Floyd's family, while we're on Capitol Hill or going to the White House saying that, you know, if we want to honor George Floyd's legacy, we finally need to have substantive police reform. Because we know that the federal system isn't fixing the, the policing issues. So we are taking it upon ourselves. We're putting it on our shoulders to go from state to state, anybody that will listen to us to speak, to actually preach the word of why this is so important. And what Ben said is true. So if we can't fix the problem on a federal level, we're going to try state by state, county by county, city by city. Mr. Crump, when some of these uh, national tragedies happen and garner this national attention, we see you there frequently. Um, how, how do you make that happen? Do you approach some families or do they call you? No, we get about 10,000 calls a week um, from a lot of marginalized people who feel that they don't have a voice. Um, a lot of African Americans, a lot of uh, Latinos, and so the good thing about working with people like Tony and other lawyers around the country is you can try to scale. You can try to say we can assist more people in having a chance at justice. And so I think where this all those big names you know about, for every Brianna, for every George Floyd, I dare say there's over 500 that are just as bad that nobody knows their name. And, and, and understand, people sometimes think that, oh, it's a big case and we're taking it. When most of these cases, when they call us, it's not a big case. Uh, the media don't show up. No, Breonna Taylor is the perfect example. Her uh, local lawyer and her family called pleading with me to get involved so something could happen where Breonna just wouldn't be swept under the rug. And then it was a lot of effort, a lot of ingenuity that made everybody say her name, Breonna Taylor. So there's, there's criminal charges and convictions, there's uh, wrongful death settlements, but what does justice look like? What do the families that you work with and represent, what do they tell you justice is for them? You know, justice uh, is many things to many different people, but what the family wants, obviously they want the killers or the people who uh, abused them or battered them to be held accountable. Obviously, we want full justice because oftentimes they said black people, they could either get one or the other, either you get a criminal conviction or you get a civil resolution, but you all couldn't get both. Well, George Floyd was the case where we wanted to show the world that now black people too are entitled to the full promises of the Constitution. The most important part that um, Attorney Ramanucci and I have just being dogmatic about is trying to help their legacies with policy to say, because policy affects us all. You know, the criminal conviction is good for society. The civil uh, settlement or verdict helps the family directly, but policy is universal and that can help prevent the next George Floyd or Tyree Nichols or, you know, Ronald Green, any of them. And that's really what I believe they want is to have the life that was snuffed out mean more than just another hashtag. Because George Floyd was the template for establishing that black lives 
have the same value, if not more, than white. That is where we had to push the envelope beyond. And so what is justice? Justice differs from case to case, but we are ensuring that as we go throughout this country representing people who have been aggrieved by police officers or by municipalities as a result of misconduct, that we ensure that the value of life is equal to all. And Benjamin Crump was back in Chicago last week to join Romanucci for a conversation at the DuSable Black History Museum about the reverberations of George Floyd's murder by Minneapolis police officers back in 2020. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And join us tomorrow night at 5.30 and 10 for Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Governor Pritzker faces down migrant spending, education funding, and a projected shortfall ahead of his budget address. And following up on the troubled and much delayed rollout of the revamped application process for federal student aid. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm committed to giving back to the community through law and philanthropy.